Coming to you from the city of the weird. Exploring topics from the esoteric and unexplored to dimensions unknown. Shining a light of truth on the darkest corners of our reality. Welcome to the Curious Realm. Well, hello everybody. Happy Tuesday night. Hope you are doing well. Coming at you here from the heartland of Texas, North Austin. Hope everybody's had a good week. I have been frantically getting the pre-record schedule ready. My my wonderful wife, as always, will be running the control deck over here while I am gone. Um making sure that all of the pre-recorded content goes out live every Tuesday night. As always, we will still be coming to you, though in a pre-recorded fashion with new content. Um, Point of pride that we have never, even even back in the days of Dudes and Beer before we rebranded five and a half years of that show, I, I have never, ever put out repeat content. I've never done a best of, I've never... I guess, really taking a Tuesday off unless it was to go to work. And even then, uh, for this 21 days, it'll be three weeks of great content. We have some fantastic guests coming up. Uh, Next week, we have Billy Joe Kane and Reverend Michael J.S. Carter. Uh, The week following, we have Daniel Duke and Joshua Shapiro, followed by Dennis Stone and our good friend Gretchen Cornwall. So some good topics coming up, some good folks Uh, Some great research. And speaking of which, our second guest tonight, uh, Chester Moore, we just featured him in our live coverage at the Falk Monster Festival because of his new book, Bigfoot South. Um, But we will be talking with him tonight about the recent great white sightings here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Growing up in the Bay of Yuhu near Galveston, uh, it's what I always called the Bay of Yuhu. Uh, or Galveston rather was the Bay of Yuhu. Um, and I never realized that there's great white sharks that just kick it around in the Gulf of Mexico, um, in that chocolatey water. So, um, we'll be getting into that. We'll be getting into what that means. We'll be getting into how long they've been there. Uh, and more our guest in the first segment. This is a topic I have been wanting to get into for years and years. Many times I have been asked, why haven't you done a top, why haven't you done an episode on ley lines? Why haven't you done an episode on earth grid energies? Things like that. Um, It's because I have yet to be able to, until now, connect with somebody who literally specializes in that area. As y'all know, I like to demystify a topic. Um, So welcome to the show. Maria Wheatley, how are you doing this evening? Uh, this morning. Yes, oh, yeah, morning absolutely. for you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. I've been perusing your new book, Secret History of Stonehenge, and uh, Stonehenge, Standing Circles, things like that, uh, other, other such structures that lay on ley lines are fascinating uh how did you how did you first get into the world of dowsing let's start there because uh dowsing is probably one of the most ancient technologies out there absolutely i got into dowsing when i was very young because of my late father he was considered one of the uk's master dowsers and so it's in the family literally in the blood and i douse from a very very early age and i'm still dowsing now 
and and uh, you know dowsing can be used for everything from like hey i need to i need to dig, dig a well on my property like traditional water witching to um finding rare earth minerals all all kinds of things uh dowsers use and it's it's pretty remarkable even the concept of being able to map dows you know being able to dows with pendulums and maps things like that um how how exactly does dowsing work maria dowsing works because it's an extension of your sixth sense although theories do abound so if you imagine that it's a, a dowsing rod or a pendulum is an extension of your sixth sense and it's believed that when you target something especially if you're dowsing for minerals or earth energies or ley lines or underground water the energy coming out of the ground makes the muscles twitch and it will make your rod move that's one explanation of dowsing although that doesn't explain map dowsing as easily oh i myself have been studying things like uh remote viewing i've been taking remote viewing classes things like that and it's it's interesting to me how uh one of the concepts of that is kind of the almost the opposite of meditation um and it's it's almost like automatic writing kind of just letting your imagination go letting your connection with something just come to you how do you go about dialing into something that you are attempting to douse for yourself that's a really good question for example if i'm dousing for one type of earth energy say for example a spiral pattern that occurs at the center of most sacred sites worldwide what i would do is i tune into that i visualize what i'm going to douse and i ask my dousing rod to locate that target so you're tuning into one thing and tuning everything else out and that's how you douse for particular types of earth energies and lays that is very interesting and uh, how was this something that you were naturally able to do? Was it something that your father introduced you to and taught you techniques of? Uh, how did you come about it? Well, water divining, looking for underground water streams and rivers or spring heads, even better for water sources, was something that I started with. Then my late father got given the surveys of ancient sites worldwide, actually, from other master dowsers. So I've inherited a legacy dowsing archive of surveys of earth energies across the world, starting in 1899. So the, the legacy archive I've got allows me to look at how other master dowsers douse and, and about other ancient sites, what are located there, the earth energies there, the ley lines there that have been solidly researched for decades wow wow and uh, you know once again these these sites range all over the world the idea of ley lines and an energetic grid around the earth uh is is not really a new concept is it no i mean if you look back to one of the original writers and researchers on ley lines he's called alfred watkins he was around in the 1930s and he realized that ancient sites were in straight lines but it's moved on a lot since that day so original ley lines were thought to have been a straight line with sacred sites are placed upon them but now we know for example you have lay systems what's a lay system that's where you get a straight line with ancient sites sighted upon it and you've got a female earth current entwining it and a male earth current entwining it a bit like the symbol of the caduceus that's a lay system and it's the earth currents that are really the power in the land and then you get other types of ley lines, which is, for instance, you get the five Plutonian solids, like the cube, like the tetrahedron, for example, mm. like a pentagon shape. And all of these interact with one another. And you can vector across the world from one point to another, for instance, like Egypt to Stonehenge, 
for example. And then you vector in a, a plutonium solid type of lay system worldwide, and that becomes a grid system, which sometimes sites will align and you know that you have that system, and at other times they don't. But it's one way of exploring sacred sites worldwide. So there's many different types of lays, but the major lay system is what people look for. That's the power in the land. And this is interesting when you start getting into especially modern concepts of connected energies. Once once you start looking at people like Nikola Tesla and his work, um, the, the ideas of being able to transmit energy even through the ground uh, via distance. Um, and the idea that these sites are connected uh, so that their energies are connected um, when especially when you start looking at stone circles in the UK things like that uh, that's something as I was telling you before the show that we've talked with Graham Phillips about numerous times the idea that uh, the energy of these sites was connected for those that used them Yes, not just through ley lines. The, the, the real power in the land are the earth currents, the mm. yin and yang earth currents that entwine it. In England, there's a very famous ley line. It's called the St. Michael line, and it has the Mary current and the Michael current entwining it, for example. That, that's just the names they were coined. But that system, that very system goes worldwide. And it's believed that, for example, Glastonbury in England and Avebury is the heart chakra, that those earth currents go on to Moscow, which is a, a power place. And then it goes on to a mountain in Tibet and all the way to Bali and then on to Uluru in Australia. That's one system that was discovered in the 1960s by Robert Kuhn. So these earth currents, as well as the grid system and the ley lines, they also are global. So we don't just have one thing that's global and then you have more extraordinary earth currents that many uh, people may be, such as Graham Phillips, don't document because they're not professional dowsers. And that's called the geospiral energy pattern. The ancient peoples, they looked for this spiral pattern and they made that the esoteric center of the site. So that could be Stonehenge, that could be the pyramids. You always get this spiral pattern. What manifests that spiral pattern is a very, very, very deep aquifer, water that isn't groundwater, and that's water that's fallen from the sky and fills up the aquifers. This is a different type of water that is believed by esoteric water diviners, such as myself, to be water that's born within side of the earth. That generates a spiral energy pattern. We've measured that with equipment, and it, it equates to about the same frequency in hertz, seven hertz. It's your brain, which yeah. is a relaxing zone. So it really relaxes you. It's an alpha brainwave mode. So we can look at different types of earth energies. And what the ancients were doing, they would do different rituals, I suggest, in different parts of the monument, decreed by what sort of energies are present. They would enter a monument, normally through an avenue. So before you get to a stone circle, you'd have a processional way, an avenue that leads to that monument and the same in places like Stonehenge and you would find that that follows an earth current and you've just brought up scientists discover gigantic oceans 700 kilometers beneath the earth we as water diviners my family going back to the age of seven years old was taught this long long before science decreed that that was an actuality yeah. so we can look at an ancient site look at the avenues they're normally earth Earth currents. The esoteric center is the heart of the site, the holiest of holies. And at places like Stonehenge, they've been marked by an individual standing stone, for example. It's called the altar stone at Stonehenge, or the altar stones, because I believe one was stolen uh, mm. many centuries ago. And that would mark the geospiral energy pattern a bit like an uh, acupuncture needle going into a meridian line. Interesting. Now, 
yeah, once you have that acupuncture point, that uh, meridian line, so to speak, activated by the acupuncture needle, then the stones, I have proved this, behave in a particular way. They start to take that earth energy and they have, imagine energy bands, five of which are above ground, two of below, and they start transmitting energy. We measured those uh, with my team and they emit energy only on the dousable points that are those energy bands it's a bit like they're converting the earth energy into aerial energy that's neolithic wi-fi thousands of years ago long before we coined the phrase interesting and you know um the idea it's it's something that we discuss on the show regularly maria the idea of crystals and and other rocks and their vibrational uses and and the understanding that ancient cultures and ancient civilizations had of vibration i i myself do uh music therapy work and and uh make binaural beat music things like that to know that numerous sacred spots were tuned to things like 19 hertz um 119 hertz things that specifically alter our brain waves um, uh, absolutely and then frequency coming out of the stones that we measured was around about 18 hertz uh for instance so that was quite common but what i discovered of late about a few years ago that i've written about in the secret history of stonehenge is that some earth energies equate to musical harmonics m musical intervals and so it's also about not just thinking of these earth energies are powerful representing particular parts of the monument they yeah. release certain musical harmonics as well as hertzian frequencies and so it's layer after layer of information when it comes to these ancient sites and a lot of these spiral energy patterns that i mentioned earlier it's called a geo spiral that registers the perfect fifth and the perfect fifth in music allows the flow of music the flow of energy yes. so anything that goes through that perfect fifth is flowing really really harmonically and uh, the, one of the articles I've been bringing up regularly lately uh, was a Stonehenge study that actually showed that uh, the stones amplify sound, that they they are used to resonate at specific harmonics and can be used uh, the same way that we use like distance dishes in parks, things like that, where if you stand at one stone, you will hear somebody whisper at another stone. Um, that, that was read in university uh, quite a few years ago that uh, located that. That was David uh, Keats' work. And uh, But if we move on and think, okay, that's yeah. the stones themselves. That's the stones themselves. But if you imagine beneath the earth, you have an earth energy pattern that's concentric circles. And the distance between one circle and another, for example, at Stonehenge, between, between the Sarsen lintel stone circle and the Welsh blue stones, that gap in between that is mathematically corresponds to the major third in music that's what i discovered oh, not wow. just about the stones so what does the major third in music do it was used throughout the early medieval christian time in gothic cathedrals because it allows our emotions to be heightened so it's the earth can emit these as much as the stones that was discovered by uh keaton many years ago at redden university it's, it's absolutely absolutely astonishing what goes on beneath our feet oh absolutely absolutely and and once again something that our ancient cultures were deeply deeply tied to that is that is something that we bring up regularly maria the idea that uh we have lost touch with this connection because we are no longer in tune with the earth the way that we once were at one point, if you were out of tune with the earth, if you didn't know what stars were rising in the sky when, uh, you did not know when to put seed in the ground. You did not know what to hunt when or when to move camp so that you didn't freeze to death. 
You know, the, these were things that were integral to life as we knew it at one point. So to, to understand that these, these places were energetically charged, that these places were used for healing, that these places were used for religious ceremony, things like that, uh, was much more commonplace. Oh, absolutely. And it, 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 uh, sites such as Stonehenge were far, far more than just a calendrical site. Because, for example, most people would say that the heel stone, it's an outlying stone from Stonehenge, was aligned to the midsummer sunrise. But every single archaeo astronomer to date now realizes it's a part of a much, much more complex cycle to do with the moon. And every nine years, the moon would rise above the heel stone. And that isn't really just to do with like an agricultural year. It's a ceremonial year because it doesn't really have anything to do with, you know, the planting of seeds. And then when we look to ancient manuscripts about uh, places like Stonehenge, uh, written by Geoffrey of Monmouth in the 12th century, mm -hmm. he says, no stone at Stonehenge doth not have healing power. So we can look at Stonehenge for being a healing center. Well, what makes it a healing center is the earth energies upon which it's sited. But in my legacy archive, going back to the 1940s to the 1960s, the curator of Stonehenge for more than 20 years he recorded a phenomena that was happening at one of the stones. It was one of the trilophons, which is the huge, gigantic stones, which is uh, two stones with a stone on top. And it's uh, stone number 51 and number 52, for those that like to look up on the internet, which stone I'm talking about. On the outer face of that stone, even in a drought, even when you were going to Stonehenge just to look around, there was once a hole in that stone that went down the length of an arm, about two feet into the heart of the stone. And in a drought, it would fill up with water. And it was considered to be an absolutely healing stone. And that water would fill up literally when your back was turned. Stare at the water and you wouldn't be able to find it. It became renowned for healing eczema and for healing and so what did english heritage do which was then the ministry of works a government department they blocked that uh, hole up with concrete and plastic so it doesn't produce water anymore and that's exactly that stone there we can see the hole in it now that got blocked up with uh, wow. concrete and it got blocked up with plastic and if you look below you can actually see where the water used to run off and cause what's called water erosion that's trilithon 51 and 52 and and it says right there natural hollow in the southeast face of the stone which had been filled with concrete probably in the 50s um and uh, you know um to to know that that was done is is pretty interesting um because yes. once again exactly. the people people for i guess thousands of years have been coming to stonehenge for its healing qualities even even the blue stones themselves uh come from an area that people went to to be healed by the springs that the blue stones were near that's right. That's according to uh, uh, Professor Tim DeVille and the late Jeffrey Wainwright. They were the uh, main people that spoke about the Priscelli Mountains that way. And absolutely, there was always that myth that they were healing if it was combined with water. With the water. So, so no matter what ancient reference was, it was always to do with water. That's why Trilithon 51 is so important. But the other thing about the uh, Priscelli Blue Stones is that they're three times more magnetic than any other stone in the British Isles. And they were imported. And there's many different types of blue stones. There's rhyolite blue stone that is very, very magnetic. It's a volcanic ash type of 
stone mm. and then you have spotted dolerite blue stone which is the one which Jeffrey Wainwright and Tim DeVille said mixes with water is very healing but I think that goes back to that trilithon that produced the water and because I have this legacy archive I'm the first person since the 1960s to release this information that it was a healing point at Stonehenge and uh, that it, that is some remarkable information to to have your hands on uh, Maria what other information do you have inside of all inside of that literal decades of research into this amazing location uh, yes, in the secret history of Stonehenge, I cover many, many other sites besides, like the Sphinx Temple and the pyramids, because I take people regularly to uh, ancient sites. But one thing that I did notice about uh, Stonehenge and other stone circles across the British Isles, no one had recorded where particular people were buried in the distant past. So in the Bronze Age, that's around 2500 BC to 1100 BC, Nobody had looked at the burial deposits. And what mm. I found was a pattern around places like Stonehenge. The shaman and the shah women and the high priests and the high priestesses, they were buried in a particular manner with certain artifacts. And then you had different types of people buried in different ways. So what I discovered was the ancient shaman of Stonehenge as well that were always on what's called the axis line of a ancient site what's an axis line that's really where it faces the midsummer sunrise and the midwinter sunset that was the line that where the magicians the healers of the past used to be placed and when i started looking at their artifacts and looking at archaeological reports they appeared very different to the average person they were highly tattooed for example an analysis of what they thought was needles that were made to puncture leather in the distant past we now know that they had skin on them that looked like it had black pigment on so we believe that they were highly highly tattooed and also they had jet earrings that were stretchers a lots lots of young people these days have mm. stretches in their ears yeah and it stretches the ear out that's exactly what was happening in the prehistoric times of Stonehenge. They were wearing black jet stretchers in their ears. They've been analyzed and they had skin on them as well. And also they had lip piercings. And if we're into reincarnation, if we're looking to patterns of the past and the future, well, we can say the Gen Z generation, we call yeah. it the Gen Z uh, here in the UK, well, they're appearing very similar to the ancient priesthood Same. of Stonehenge. And all of this is fact. It really is. And they were attracted to particular types of crystal. They carried a medicine bag with them. And in that medicine bag, they had amber and jet. And amber and jet have electromagnetic properties where they can attract uh, materials like wool towards them. It's a bit like, you know, when you comb your hair and you get that static electricity, yeah. so to speak, and your hair goes up. That does that with uh, amber as well. And they wore finely woven, silky-like material and had gold trestles in their hair and massive amber breastplates i have looked at the ancient shamans what what did they look like what did they wear what were they doing at stonehenge and this is another fact that is quite mind-blowing a bit like in a catholic church the father the priest would have a, a swinging censor with mm. incense and he would walk around and you smell that beautiful incense with all around stonehenge and other stone circles they found these so-called incense pots they've recently been analyzed and they did not contain incense they contained opiates so you're now around a mind-altering substance at a sacred site with mind-altering earth energies 
and combine that, you now probably had at Stonehenge not just a healing centre, but an oracle centre, a bit mm. like Delphi is to Greece. Why would I say that about Stonehenge? Again, if you go back to ancient manuscripts about Stonehenge, they start saying the stones could speak. The stones would give you oracles, and it yep. was the goddess that would give you the oracle. It would be the healing god Apollo that would give you the healing. So I think Stonehenge was an oracle center as well as a healing center if we look to the ancient manuscripts that were written about that sacred site. That is that is really fascinating to consider the idea that, you know, especially when you when you start looking at yes, the the opiates that have been found, the the hallucinogenic material um that's that's been found there recently it's it's pretty interesting and uh you go you also get into uh the history of elongated skulls in the area as well absolutely i i was the founder of that in the uk uh because uh, i was looking at uh, anthropologists reports about the distant past and they kept saying a curious thing long barrows which are neolithic uh, orthodox dating they go back about five and a half thousand years and to the much taller people that were bronze age people that's going back about four and a half thousand years the ancient uh, anthropologists writing from the 1900s uh, onwards kept saying long skulls long barrows round skulls round barrows so i thought i'm going to investigate this what what do they mean and the journey took me to cambridge university and because i was studying at, at oxford university at the time i was allowed to see human remains you can't just ask to see human remains in yeah. the uk and you probably can't in the us no. because you know you have indigenous issues you have a lot of other issues and uh, so i was granted permission and soon as i saw that skull I realized it was an elongated skull and this person came from Stonehenge. So early in the Neolithic, the builders of Stonehenge, the ancient DNA, we call that a DNA, has all been analyzed as well. And we know that they were the ones that built the ancient stone circles. And then by the Bronze Age, 2500 BC, the ADNA suggests that really tall people from Europe, the Beaker culture, as it's called in archaeological terms, came over to the British Isles and then began to dominate the ancient sites, decommission the long skulled sites. And around Stonehenge, there was a bit of, bit of a battle because the elongated skulled people showed signs of being mortally wounded by a metal instrument and it was a beaker people that brought over metal to the UK. So we can see that the ancient people had elongated skulls and I photographed them at Oxford and in the secret history of Stonehenge I show photograph after photograph of the elongated skulled people which you're just showing now were very similar to the elongated skulled people of Malta and across Europe actually so it's not just confined to places like mm. Stonehenge. It's from much, much further afield. And if the elite, every person in the Neolithic was born with a long skull in the British Isles at that time. But the elite, they extended their skull, and we're seeing one at Stonehenge now, through cranial deformation to make it that little bit, that extra length. And that was the priesthood, and that was the high queens and high kings. They used cranial deformation to exaggerate their already long skull. And that was another discovery of mine because on reports, it says if you put a board to extend your skull, cranial deformation, you're left with two scars down the front of the skull. And all of the elite had those two scars, which says that they were using cranial deformation. Interesting. And, uh, you know, once again, there's two. It, it's fascinating to me how many traits are shared globally amongst ancient civilizations and, and elongated skulls are one of them uh, from 
South America to North America to Asia. Um, it's it's Egypt. Um, a, a trend that seems to be something global and uh, seems to be part of these megalithic cultures, Maria. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you can put an elongated skull from Stonehenge next to one from ancient Egypt, and they are almost identical. And the, the Prakis skulls of South America, they're more cone heads, and yeah. they've been widely investigated by Brian Forster, who forwarded my book on Stonehenge. So we can see that the skull represented something to the ancient sites, and possibly even... Uh, made the people look at their ancient sites and how they're going to build them because like I said earlier the long barrows which are a monument in the uh, ancient world were for long skulls and the round barrows were for the round skulled people so the, sh the shape of the monument was decreed by the skull shape and size and even with the round skulled people i noticed and discovered that they too practiced cranial deformation because they were making their skulls not longer this time but much rounder and again it seems to be the elite were doing that so we know that the skull inspired different types of ancient sites wow wow and and to to once again see that connection uh on a on a macro scale on a on a large scale across numerous civilizations is what is really really remarkable uh now and we've got you for about another 20 minutes let's let's go back into dowsing real quick and how so, these energies are found how do you how do you go about um, beginning to trace that spiral pattern at a sacred site and how do you differentiate uh, that spiral pattern from let's say a, another just general hit Absolutely. So let's say I'm at a place like Avebury. Avebury's the world's largest stone circle. I live just down the road from it, uh, literally. And I say I had a pair of dowsing rods and I was just walking around that ancient site. Because there's so many different types of energy, my rods are going to cross. They're going to cross them. Mm. They're going to cross. So a master dowser will uh, be able to interpret what they have found how do i do that i do that through uh training it's a bit like a mathematician you're going to have to start off learning your times table you're going to have to start learning sure. about fractions and the same uh, it becoming a master dowser you just learn about different types of earth energy and their patterns in the land once you know what pattern in the land uh, is you can begin to interpret it so for example a spiral pattern once you know how to douse it is very prominent you know that that's very very deep underground water then you have what we've discussed ley lines then you have particular grid lines and some grid lines can be toxic to live above mm. some can be very positive to live above so a good master dowser looks at people's houses and people's homes and they will look for the toxic energies and say basically avoid those and they will look at positive energies and say interact with them so if you imagine that the the earth can emit particular types of energy patterns you learn how to interpret those and some are positive and some are negative to our health and that's what the ancients were very very aware of which ones were positive and they'd obviously integrate those into their ancient sites so some parts of the an ancient site can be healing not just because of the stones like the healing blue stones sure. but because those blue stones are set above a healing earth energy you've got a double now you haven't just got the stone you've got the earth energy it is set above so all of these things contribute to an ancient site but our own homes we can be very practical these days and i have taught architects how to detect these particular types of earth energies to include in new builds because if we have a relaxing type of earth energy and you've got a new build a school or a hospital you can say ah 
that's going to be that particular area which is going to relax people whereas if I've got an office and I want product productivity from my team I don't want that necessarily really relaxing earth energy I want one that's more of a stimulant for example mm. so we can decode land and that's what I do uh, professionally as well so you could give me some uh, particular type of land and I can start to say ah oh, it's got this type of earth current it's got this type of energy this is going to be utilized in particular ways that's what the ancients were doing and they were adept and and uh, you know how mu how much of that especially with the earth energies things like that how much of that is amplified by natural mineral around it uh that kind of stuff maria Absolutely. I mean, this was all documented, uh, you know, about a hundred years ago, where they looked at minerals and they looked at earth energies and amplification. So, for example, in Arkansas, it's very famous mm. for its quartzian uh, beds yep. that would amplify something. All minerals would. Iron would do the same thing. Gold, silver beds uh, as well. And it will make the earth energies behave in a particular manner. For example, if you've got hard granite, if you live above granite, then earth energies tend to form what's called a chevron pattern. They start to zigzag across that very hard rock. Mm. Whereas if you live above a softer rock, like on the Giza plateau of ancient Egypt is limestone, Stonehenge and Avebury are sited above chalk. That meanders a kind of earth current a bit more. So yes, you're right. The geology of place will say how particular earth energies flow. And if they're flowing in a chevron pattern, they're very energetic, for, for example. So we know that yeah. particular minerals allow earth energies to behave in particular manners yeah and especially once you start including the laminar flow of water inside of those minerals and around those minerals like not not many people are aware of the fact that a running current through copper pipes or, or running water through copper pipes creates a current running water through limestone creates a current um, uh, absolutely and what a water diviner does just to add to that because you're absolutely right uh 100 but in water divining you have the color of the water as mm. well so say i'm going to world ball uh, i want to know if that water is going to be good to drink and if it has too much iron in it that's going to be on what's called the red sector of the water divining dial if it's got too much copper in it it's going to be green magnesium would come out yellow you use a color dial to check what sort of mineral quality is in the water ideally you want it to come up with the color blue literally water like is known to be uh, blue and healing waters of like lord's fame in france which is a m miraculous healing water they tend to be on the violet end of the color spectrum and what's called ultra white so we we use these color references to know what the what the water is naturally let alone when it goes into copper pipes and and sure. other influences besides yeah yeah and uh, you know um especially once you once you start considering the idea of uh mineralization in water the the way that our bodies absorb things stuff like that you know yeah you don't you don't want a bunch of iron in your water that's why we have water filtration systems in our homes that kind of stuff and having a water witch come out um living here in texas it is it is actually a pretty common practice mm -hmm. um it's it's not a rarity for uh somebody to come out and douse a new property to find a proper place to dig a drinkable well because it's different to have uh, water that you can use for machinery, things like that, or water that is palatable that you can drink. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I used to do that, you know, many, many years ago, uh, water divine, and it's where I kind of was my base point, if you will, before the, the earth energies. And if you find what's called the head of the spring, rather than just an underground stream, you find the head of the spring, it comes up under pressure so that you don't have to have a pump all mm. of the time. But more than that, you've got gallons per minute coming yeah. up and that will be re replenished and it's fresh pure 
clean water when it's a spring head. So I tended to look for what's called the head of the spring. Uh, and you're right, so if you've got cattle, they can have an underground stream. It doesn't have to be, you know, 100% uh, pure. And, and also water is... Uh, we see it uh, in, in the UK, in esoteric water, divine in terms. It can influence your own body water. Mm. And so you can start to relate to underground water in healing terms as well, because homeopaths inform us that water has memory. Water has that instringent memory point. So what do we find uh, at ancient sites? Very, very deep aquifers with that spiral pattern I mentioned earlier. So they become the Akashic record of place because they memorize that which went before. So very sensitive people can go to an ancient site, tune into the very deep waters and understand the Akashic record of place. And I've taken people to ancient sites worldwide time and time again. And it's interesting to know that certain uh, people, they go to a particular point and then uh, recount what happened and it's very similar to mm. other accounts so i know that that place has recorded the past and uh, you know uh, all of this maria even even the idea of using a color wheel with water witching things like that um all comes down to frequency it all it all comes down to uh the resident frequency at a location and having people that are tuned into that, uh, having people that are able to sense that frequency and able to dial into it. Um, we have about 10 minutes left uh, before we get into your tours, things like that. How do people go about, um, I guess, sensing that frequency in the world around them? How can they go about finding those negative energies in their home or on their property to try to get rid of? What can they do if they come across those negative energies, Maria? Yes, there's many things that you could do. If you, It's called geopathic stress. That means toxic earth energies, and that phrase was coined many, many uh, decades ago. You can literally do use some energy devices to what's called negate the geopathic mm. stress. And that's a copper coil. You get two bits of uh, copper wire, uh, wrap them around each other like platin hair, so to speak, you know, just roping it around each other and making a circle. And that negates to some degree uh, toxic earth energies. But the best thing to do is get just a little bit of uh, training and find out how to find the curry net the banker grid, they're toxic. Not all grid systems, not all lays are good for us. Mm. In fact, energy travels too fast in a straight line. So you want to slow that energy down. And there's particular ways of finding that with dowsing and interacting with it. And literally a couple of hours training, bingo, you can go out and find that time and time again. And it has been noticed that geopathic stress, it doesn't matter what type of uh you could have acupuncture for example you could have orthodox uh healing like chemotherapy radiotherapy if you go back to the geopathic stress stone that you were sleeping above your body does not self-heal no matter what type of therapy that you wow. have so we can enhance our own health by living in harmony with the earth has been known since the 1960s and 11,000 houses were documented by Dr. Kathy Batchelor to understand the detrimental effects of grid systems. I I am, I mean, as you can see over my shoulder as my audience sees, I, I am swathed in RF frequency in my world. I am a I am an audio video engineer. Um, I am constantly, and we are now constantly, Maria, surrounded by energy fields beyond what we would naturally be surrounded by. Um, and that can be hard to ground against. That can be hard to uh, say it doesn't interact with those negative fields that already exist in the world around us. 
Absolutely. I mean, you've really hit on something uh, there because it has been noticed in the past 20 years, especially with the advent of Wi-Fi and uh, et cetera, that that can interact with the grid systems that are geopathic stress, such as the curry net and sometimes the Hartman grid. So yes, we live in a mid, a double whammy, if you will. So the best thing to do with that, if you are around a lot of, you know, your, your laptop, mm. audio equipment, your router or router, as you pronounce it in the, the, the US, then it's good to be around some black tourmaline, go out and, and ground. And, and do things like that. I mean, that's the, the best thing really to do. And copper as well sets up an mm. electro field and that will start to dissipate. Like I said, if you get a copper coil, it will start to dissipate earth, earth energies that are, are toxic. I was really, you know, fascinated when I went to the US. I, I do a lot of uh, ancient site earth energy work in the yeah. US. And I really loved when I, I wanted to go, what you would say in the UK, on Route 66, and I was told, no, it's Route 66. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a soda and pop situation for us. Because, um, yeah, oh, like really? here in Texas, it's Route. We call, oh. them, we call them Roots. But oh, everywhere God. else, it's Route. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, I went on route route 66, and uh, and I was I was thrilled. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's interesting because those are places, and and uh, you know, uh, we should have a whole nother conversation at some point about how we endow spaces with energy, um, because that that's one of those places that yeah, there are there are interesting spots along it that have kind of popped up paranormally over over the last many years um and i think a lot of that is because of the energy that we give and the mystery that we give to locations you know oh, um, absolutely i mean that's been looked into by master Dow says how we relate to space how yeah. we relate to place and uh, again the places can almost like record uh, what what we put into them what has happened before so yes i i totally agree with that 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 is in uh, occurrence and especially so where where you get particular types of crossing points of lays mm. where you get uh, a, what's called a geodetic power center a geodetic power center like stonehenge isn't just a crossing point of lays it's where you get one, two, three, four, five, six different types of energy in occurrence at once. That's what makes a power place. But we can interact with that. We can put in our different thought vibrations mm. and different energies besides as well. So it's not just about the, the power of place. It's about the power of the person that interacts with the power of place. And, uh, you know, that brings up something. I've got you for about four or five more minutes but in the, the, my last question for you because one of the things i bring up regularly on the show maria is the idea especially when it comes to paranormal investigation um the idea that if if you are preparing equipment if you're getting things ready to go out somewhere should you really be thinking about the location should you be getting excited about the location should you should you be thinking about stories you've heard about the location, the way that instruments have reacted? Um, or should you be going into it as blank slate and cold as possible so that you are not energetically affecting the location that you're going to investigate? Absolutely. And that reminds me of an experiment we did many years ago at Avebury, the world's largest stone circle, uh, with uh, a really good researcher called Rodney Hale that's worked with a lot of other people besides. So I'll give him a bit of a shout. And uh, I really wanted at the centre of Stonehenge something to uh, happen. You know, I was excited about it, a bit like what you were saying. Mm. And he kept saying, Maria, each time you get around the equipment, you're interacting with the equipment, yeah? So let's, you know, take that time out. Let's take that time yeah. to, you know, have the deep breath, uh, et cetera, because our consciousness will interact with anything, whether that's equipment, whether that's the ancient site, whether that's a crystal in my hand, 
yeah we're constantly into that exchange of consciousness so i thoroughly uh, agree with that that we can influence power of place interesting interesting because uh, you know it is it's something that i bring up regularly whenever i speak in panels that kind of stuff whenever i'm here on the show with guests uh, especially when it comes to investigating the paranormal, um, because that, that, I mean, that's quite literally the root of, uh, remote viewing was, was a paper by Hal Putoff, a laser scientist that when scientists went home and thought about their experiment, that they were actively affecting the experiment in the lab. Absolutely. And I think that's the same. When I do house clearing, for example, and house healing, and I go in mm. investigating the paranormal in houses, I go in there with no expectation now. None. Yeah. And I, I go in there to investigate from a kind of blank canvas, if yeah. you will. You know, and I think that's the best way to approach, from my perspective, to interact with paranormal activity in people's homes. And I, thank you so much for sharing that because it, it, I believe the same thing. You know, it's it's one of those. Uh, I I am a firm believer that we are responsible for any any energy we drag behind us into a room, Maria. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so absolutely. I, I want to thank you for a fantastic conversation this evening. The time literally flew by. Before we let you go, uh, you actively do tons of energetic tours. You have one coming up uh, to Chaco Canyon. Tell us a little bit about that. Tell us a, a, real quick in the next couple minutes uh, what what folks can expect with the trip to Chaco Canyon with you, Maria. Yeah, come and meet me in Chaco Canyon. I'll be teaching you all about the different types of earth energies there because I discovered that the Great North Road is a straight line associated with Chaco Canyon, that that's in fact a lay. And I was talking about a lay system earlier where you have a yin and yang earth current entwining it. And I discovered in ancient America that you have, for instance, uh, a male and female current going through Charco Canyon, just like at Stonehenge, just mm. like at the stone circles around here. And we'll be interacting with that. And just north of uh, Charco Canyon, you have Aztec ruins, and we'll be looking at that ancient site on the second day. It's a weekend workshop exploring Earth energies and ancient America. And I am absolutely drawn to places. And next year, you, you mentioned you've got Dennis Stone on the show mm. uh, America Stonehenge I'm going to be at America Stonehenge on May the 3rd next year, dousing ancient America there as well cool. I've doused 17 different countries and I'm consider, well, considered to be one of the foremost master dousers in the UK and I can't wait to be back in the United States and, and uh, I will definitely have to try and make it up there whenever you're up there, Dennis Stone has become a very good friend actually and uh, I love his location it is it is absolutely a fascinating place and um i want to thank you so much for a fantastic and candid conversation about dowsing i would love to have you on again and again once again this is one of the most fascinating topics in the world to me um and absolutely remarkable that one of the oldest technologies known to man is still out there being used um and fully not, I wouldn't say explained by science yet, but uh, man, there is a ton of lab work out there on it, and it's it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, and I'd love to return sometime. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I will be in touch with links and everything else. You have a great rest of your evening over there in the UK. Uh, well, great rest of your very, very early morning, actually. <laughs> so um, take care, Maria. Thank you so much again. Thank you. All Cheerio. Right. Take care. Bye. Man, um, what an absolutely interesting conversation for Maria Wheatley, folks. Make sure to stop on by her website, the AverberryExperience.co.uk. Um, all kinds of amazing workshops, courses, uh, things like that. If you want to know more about dowsing and what dowsing can do for you, for your life, for your property, things like that. She is literally one of the world's foremost experts, folks. So 
there you have it. We finally did an episode on ley lines and dowsing. Um, I have been asked by so many people why I have not covered that topic. And it is quite literally because I like to talk to experts about it. And I had yet to be able to find anybody except for maybe like, you know, Johnny down the road who could take a willow branch and find something. But to talk with Maria Wheatley about it tonight was absolutely incredible and awesome. So thank you so much for your time tonight, Maria. Uh, when we come back from this commercial break, everybody, we will be joined by our good friend, uh, Chester Moore. He is the author of Bigfoot South. Make sure to go out and get that new book. We will be talking with him about his new website, uh, GulfGreatWhites.com. We will be talking about great white sharks that right here in the Galveston Bay, in the Gulf of Mexico, all kinds of stuff. When we get back from these quick breaks, we'll be talking with Chester Moore right after this. The Curious Realm Podcast is your source for the latest and greatest news and events in the world of the paranormal, esoteric, and forbidden knowledge. And there's no better way to spark the conversation than with items from the Curious Realm store. Choose from fan favorites like hoodies, mouse pads, coffee mugs, and more. Buy books and items from your favorite Curious Realm guests. Get your hands on the latest gear for paranormal investigations and experiments we discuss on the show. Open your web browser and stop on by the Curious Realm store at CuriousRealm.com forward slash store to buy the latest Curious Realm wear and out of this world gifts for yourself, your family, or a mind that you want to open. That website again is CuriousRealm.com forward slash store well hello everybody and thank you so much for hanging on through that short commercial break and also thank you so much to our sponsors especially true hemp science true hemp science is my choice for CBD. I have been using their product for years and years. I ran across Christopher Lynch at a farmer's market here in Austin shortly after I had been prescribed CBD by my doctor for travel anxiety. And his product is absolutely amazing. I've been to dispensaries across the country. His is by far the best that I have found. That is why I went to him Stop on by truehimscience.com today. Use the code CURIOUS7 to get 7% off your entire cart of $50 or more and get two, count them, two free edibles on your way out the door as well. Truehimscience.com is the website that you want to go to for that. CURIOUS7 is the code that you want to use. Our guest in this segment is the amazing Chester Moore he has an awesome new website out there called Gulf Great Whites. That is our topic for tonight. I grew up on the Texas Gulf Coast, Chester. I grew up fishing. Um, I, I actively stopped wade fishing <laughs> one year after I had about a three and a half foot little, just tiny little thing, tiny little shark pull on my pull on my uh, wader belt that had a had a red drum on it. Mm -hmm. Um and after that, I was like, yeah, I'm about done wade fishing. Like, I'll go out bay fishing on a boat, something like that. But, but I ain't hopping in the water waist deep with, like, <laughs> shrimp attached to my belt anymore. You know, um, things like that. Um, and it's interesting to see over the last many years how shark instances have really, really risen in sure. the Gulf Coast. You know, we've heard about them for years uh, in California waters, things like that. Um, same thing in Florida. Uh, but here in the Texas Gulf Coast specifically, there has been a huge spike in shark activity. Yeah, so what happened was, you know, sharks, of course, were you know naturally abundant throughout the Gulf of Mexico, Pacific Atlantic, all over the world. 
And um, like many things, we thought the resource was endless. It was an endless resource. So they were harvested not only by recreational fishermen, by commercial fishermen, by long liners, which were driving, uh, were, were feeding the Asian drive for shark, uh, shark and soup and all that stuff. And sharks have low reproductive capabilities. And so you just cause a big void in shark numbers. And then back in the 90s, more restrictive regulations not only came from the recreational sector, but also the commercial sector. And people started taking the long lining issue more seriously. Now, a lot of sharks are coming back. I mean, a lot of them are restored numbers. You have very healthy numbers of black tips and spinners and bull sharks and lemon sharks and different things along the Gulf Coast. And um, I've always loved sharks. I used to tag sharks with the Moat Marine Lab, did that for two years. Oh, wow. Um, I've done a lot of work with sharks. And I think the interest, Chris, came as a little boy seeing a little movie you might have heard of before called Jaws and watching this magnificent story unfold. And I watched a guy that wanted to get in a shark cage and study them. Richard mm-hmm. drives this character, Mr. Yeah. Cooper. And then I saw this real charismatic, awesome, old, crusty fisherman, Captain Quint. Yeah. And somehow I came out as like a hybrid of those two guys, you know? It's like, uh, <laughs> you know? Truth, and truth. Th- that, that and Jacques Cousteau Ocean Specials. Yeah, right. Got me re- and growing up fishing like you got me really into the shark thing, and I've been into it my whole life. And it's an exciting time, as you said, with comebacks of sharks, not only of your more common species, Mm. but a species that many people think did not live in the Gulf, Carcharodon carcarius, the great white shark. And, and, you know, once again, I I was a child when I'm 48, going on 49 this year, so uh, I, I was probably about five six when i saw that for the first time and i i will tell you straight up my friend um it frightened the hell out of me like i, I grew up spending time on lake livingston yep and i was afraid of the water in lake livingston like never mind the logic yeah. <laughs> that there is no way a shark is in that freshwater lake that is man-made no way like maybe in a river sure there are bull sharks that get into rivers all the time you find them in the mississippi um, no. uh, but, but yeah, yeah. Like it, it was an illogical fear that I had. And especially whenever you got to the Bay of Yuhu known, known as, you know, uh, Galveston, because that Bay of Yuhu, I like that. That's good. <laughs> it's, well, I mean, it, it's all the silt from the river, you know, yes, and it, is. It, it, and yeah, it makes it to where you can't see that there, well, there are fishing waves. You can't see three feet below you, so you really don't know. It, it's one of those situations where you you are truly closer to a shark than you ever thought possible. Well, it's absolutely true, and you know, seeing Jaws and and those Jacques Cousteau ocean specials made me want to go see sh- sharks. Mm. I wanted to go underwater and look at them and and be close to them and study them. And, um, you know, you mentioned getting attacked, like your weight, like your waiting stringer getting attacked and your redfish getting hit. I'll never forget being back in like 98 in the Chandelier Islands, which are these barrier islands off the coast. They extend out by Venice, south of Venice, Louisiana, mm. over toward Biloxi, Mississippi. It's the most shark rich area of the Gulf Coast. Unbelievable amount of sharks down there. And watching a fishing guide who was with me have his stringer attacked one day by a small black tip shark. Um, yep. and what had happened a couple of days before that he had been tra- speckled trout fishing and lost his top water plug, which was a top dog from mirror lure to a shark. And on the last yeah. day of the trip, he looks back and his stringers getting attacked. He goes, Chester, it's the same shark. Three days later, the same little shark with its mirror lure still in its mouth was attacking his stringer. I mean, wow. it was. Wow, it was it was a wild story, man. And I remember the first island over there that we got in the water, and we all kind of split up, and we're going to walk around this island and wade fish it. And in five minutes, I was back on the island because there's like a seven foot long bull shark around circling me, you know. So, um, a lot of great memories of that. But you know, the ocean is an incredible place. But the Gulf of Mexico, I've been calling it the Forgotten Sea. 
Mm. because people overlook the Gulf. Yeah. Think about other than the BP horizon, the, event, the horizon oil spill thing. Yep. or a hurricane tragedy. When do you ever hear about the Gulf of Mexico and its inhabitants on Animal Planet or Discovery Channel? They never show. It's always the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, or yeah, the Caribbean. Yeah. They don't. They don't show like the the hatching of redly sea turtles on the yeah. beaches in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a huge thing. So, you know, like I had a very very good friend uh, from mm -hmm. high school, um, Brooke Shipley, Doctor Brooke Shipley. She now teaches marine biology and biology. Uh, I think it's San Jack, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, but she worked with the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife for years in the fisheries department uh, mm -hmm. doing doing rebuilds and building artificial reefs. Um, yeah, see, there's a lot of great stuff like the Ridleys are in, in the Gulf of Mexico and endangered, yep. the most endangered um, sea turtle. But you don't hear about any of that because the Gulf is just kind of like not in their media you know, rabbit hole they go down. So I've written about it several times, called it Forgotten Sea. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought with this gulfgreatwhites.com, go subscribe to the blog. Yeah, um, it's been great. It's, gonna, it's the official blog of great white sharks in the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm also going to talk about other shark species in the Gulf there as well, but it's mainly going to be great white stuff. And that's the thing, Chris, the return of the great white shark and man and in my entire journalistic journey i think that's a word journalistic um i have never had anything as interesting as how i got involved in, in in great white sharks in the gulf it's a truly amazing story um you know i i remember having little shark field guides and stuff and it, and it said gulf of mexico in the liner notes, right? And it would say Gulf of Mexico, great white sharks, you know? And huh. um, so I knew they were in the historic range, but no one ever talked about them. No one ever mentioned seeing great whites in the Gulf and stuff. So 2005, I'm fairly early into my career. I was established, but it was fairly early. A young guy I knew, he's about 10 years younger than me, was a fishing guide and he had a satellite phone and he was, I knew he was going fishing that day. And he was out in the Gulf of Mexico and my phone rings and it's him. And he says, hey, Chester, what does a Mako's teeth look like compared to a great white? And I'm like, aren't you fishing? Or just listen, what is a Mako? Because a Mako and a great white look pretty similar at a certain stage of life, right? Yep. Um, and I said, well, you know, um, a, a, a Mako has sharp, jagged teeth and a great white's perfect triangles, plus a white when they get bigger is really fat. He goes, got real silent. I'm looking at a great white right now. He pulled up to an oil rig. He said 58 miles south of the Sabine jetties. And the minute the oil rig were all pointing down at the water and saying, hey, giant shark. He didn't see it at first. They get tied up to the rig or whatever. They drift back. They put a chum bag out, and this great white shark swims around the boat, comes up. He gets a view of it because it came by the chum bag with his mouth open. Massive wow. great white. I had heard an anonymous story passed on to me from divers that encountered one in the recent, recently around then. Um, so I end up doing a little investigation, found some – data going back to 1950 in Port Aransas, where in a three-week span, there were three great whites caught off of Port Aransas, and a few NOAA notes on great whites, and published an article about that, and that was the first I know of article ever done on great whites in the Gulf of Mexico. And it was controversial, Chris. Uh, yeah. You know, it, people were like, ah, it's not real. That's BS and blah, blah, blah. So fast forward, you know, a few years and a great white shark um, pops up off the coast of Florida by Panama City in a group called O-Search. You can go to osearch.org for more info on them. O-Search. Mm -hmm. They had a satellite tag, great white, show up. And I got to write a follow-up talking about this new satellite tagging program. And then I wrote an article predicting we would see one in Texas soon. And in 2021, this is such a cool, I'm on a phone with a guy who had photographed, who had videotaped orcas in the Gulf. Oh, wow. And as I'm interviewing him about his orcas encounter 
and he gave me exclusive rights to use the orca footage in a blog post he says oh yeah and a great white's just weird out there and a great white just pinged off of a certain rig and an o search great white pinged in texas so in 2020, I predicted a great white to start showing up in Texas. In 2021, I got to break the story of the great white showing up in Texas waters. And um, I wrote an article, won an award for an article uh, called uh, Great Whites Rising in the Gulf. It was, it was so cool. But the coolest thing yet was this. And it, it is, once again, um, strange because it, it's not really the home territory of a great white shark it's it's not necessarily the waters that they would typically swim in correct well there's a lot of mysteries behind great white sharks so the there's different populations and the atlantic population seems to be that they are born we don't know exactly where necessarily somewhere in the northeast okay and they definitely grow up a little bit there and then these sub adults great whites will move down in the winter months typically down into the gulf of mexico but what happened was interesting 1997 great whites were banned from harvey could not harm because it wasn't scientifically feasible to harvest them because chris this is a this is a scary thing for a for a species yeah great whites are not sexually mature females until they're like 20, 30 years old oh wow wow and so when you harvested a bunch of female big great whites it takes a long time to replenish that population so we're coming up close to 30 years you know just a few years from now so you have a generation of great whites that have never had to worry about harvest legal harvest in the gulf plus a lot of the nets and things that caught juveniles when they came into the gulf were banned so we're seeing more yeah, enter the yeah. gulf we now have an awareness because of not only osearch but an incredible group called the atlantic white shark conservancy is tagging great whites and this is the one the atlantic white shark conservancy tag shark that is boggling minds so um just a few weeks ago really i mean february the 26th 2024 a great white shark that was tagged on december the 8th of 2023 off the coast of south carolina by a guy named captain chip michaelove for the atlantic white shark conservancy popped up 200 yards from the beach at South Padre Island. Wow. Now, she, we don't think is a breeder yet, but she's really close. She's 14.1 feet long and weighs 2,600 pounds. A lot of these whites that come in are smaller. She is a massive great white, probably entering that age of getting to be close to mature. Her name is Lebeth. You can get more information. Go to you need to download the Shark Activity app of the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy Shark Activity, and you can follow. Matter of fact, you know we recorded this here on April twenty second. She pinged all night last night in the Gulf of Mexico, She's hanging off Tampa wow. area, and she showed up at South Padre Island right off. Then. She finds herself about 75 miles or so off the coast of Sabine Pass, up my way going north, right around the oil rigs that my friend saw the Great White in 2005. And the next day when I wrote a story about this, that guy texts me and said, Chester, to think they thought we were crazy back in the mid 2000s. Yeah. And so all of these pieces anecdotally are coming together, showing that the Great Whites are natural to the Gulf. They're, the Atlantic population has a portion of it at least i'm not a, i'm not a scientist saying this but as a sure, journalist that sure. spends its time here and the warm waters of the gulf during the winter seem to be an important feeding ground for whites and like um so it, it's an incredible story it's a conservation triumph um, and, and shows that you know <laughs> like i love great whites and i, I I've, I've, I've got the cage dive with great whites that was a lifelong dream epic Epic. But, bro but brother, if I'm at the South Padre Surf waiting out with my stringer and a 2,600 pounder swims by me, I might not make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, 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 like, and uh, you know, once again, one but, of the last um, times I'd probably go into the Bay of Yuhu. Yeah. You know? yeah now, well, granted, that, but, you know, South, you Pod see, in, South Padre in South Island, Padre, you, can, you can see. 
It's you can see like, her it's well. Not, yeah, uh, yeah. You know she was a white if she swam by you because you could see it. But um, an incredible story. So what happened was I'm covering these at HigherCalling.net, my my blog I've had for years, and that's yeah. kind of the place to see almost everything I do. Everything Chester Moore is going to be over somewhere at HigherCalling.net. But there's so much great white stuff going on. Like I have a great white video up right now over yeah. there. But I had to do a blog where like the great white stuff was so overwhelming right now in terms of info coming in. I needed to create a blog that's just for that. So golfgreatwhites.com is born. I'll occasionally post something to higher calling a link out to that one, but this is going to be a specific blog that's going to have more great white in the Gulf coverage and anything else. Plus a lot of other really cool shark info from the Gulf of Mexico. And if someone subscribes and you like send me an email and contact me there, send me an email. I'm going to send you a Gulf great whites uh, logo um, decal. You can see the nice. decal for free by subscribing. And um, I just want people to learn more about these great animals in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, the Sharktivity app. Incredible, incredible app. Cool. Um, yeah, and O Search is another one. The O Search app is a great app too. They do their own stuff. But the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, you can go to my YouTube channel and Megan Winton. Um, I have Sarah, she is a research scientist from them. And we do some videos about um, Lee Beth. That's the one, her name Lee Beth was the one that showed up in um, South Padre and Sabine and showed up on the Chandelier Islands. And then she's over wow. right now hanging out around Tampa. And they told me, so what happens is there are multiple kinds of tags when they catch these sharks. One of them is a satellite tag that attaches to the, the dorsal, somewhere in the dorsal there. And they only ping or sing, signal to a satellite when they surface. So the shark mm. has to breach. Yeah, yeah. If it's, a shark, if it's a shark that doesn't come up much, like, you know, somewhere on the surface, you're not going to get a lot of signals. And their entire tagging history, which I believe goes back to around 2012, 2013, they've never had one ping like this girl. She likes to be at the surface. So um, it's giving a lot of great information. So I can't say enough about this tremendous conservation organization and also the work O-Search and others are doing as well because there's a lot being yeah. learned about great whites right now. Well, well, and that's just it. You know, it's something that they have been on the conservation list for years and years, mm -hmm. um, which means that uh, they actively get a little bit of funding for study for mm -hmm. them. Uh, so, so there has been a, a huge uh, mountain of research that's come out uh, yep. over the last many years on great whites, on their breeding, uh, like you were saying, on, on the even the fact that they do seem to come to the Gulf after they're born. Um, yeah, it's it's wild stuff. So now we're just, I just want to be the leader on this issue because in, in the Gulf, journalistically, because I have such a heart for it. And I want to connect people to being able like with our work with kids. Yeah. So I'm announcing something that hasn't been in the media yet. You're getting the first Ooh. mention. OK, um, we're doing in our ministry outreach the summer of the shark. And it's called the Summer of the Shark. And the Coastal Conservation Association of Texas is sponsoring it for us this summer. And we're taking some kids to the Texas State Aquarium to snorkel in the shark cage. Kids that in our Wild Wishes program that, that, that works with kids with, with critical cool. illness and parental loss. We've taken kids before yep. to individually where we're taking a couple of groups this summer. Already got one session booked. And they're going to get to go to the aquarium, get in the shark cage with their sandbar sharks and everything else that swims around that aquarium and learn firsthand about sharks. Then we're creating educational gift packages that we're taking these kids and we're going to go down on the beach at Padre Island, other beaches and give out kids shark education, including my new book, which you're also getting. Heck yeah. Great white sharks and other apex predators of the Gulf of Mexico and giving this stuff to kids to teach them about sharks. But more importantly, the book itself will have a whole chapter of my journey as a person and as a researcher and a journalist to let kids know if someone who was bullied and marginalized and went through the things I went through can do this, they can too. And that all comes out starting this summer. Epic, man. I And that's one of my favorite things that you do with your conservation is 
spreading into the next generation and giving that love mm-hmm. of the outdoors to yeah, man. kids that are underprivileged and don't don't have the opportunity to go do such things uh yeah, like yeah, like diving with sharks where you know um a huge confidence builder you're diving with yeah, sharks yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the truth is the scariest thing in that shark cage in the aquarium is the temperature of the water it's a little chilly but other than that yeah. it's uh once you that once i swim past you a few times that warm rush of adrenaline comes by you know uh we brought <laughs> two different girls over the last three years and did the shark cage dive and one of those girls from last year's returning this year i promise she could come back and help us with other kids that's awesome and and um, it's going to be amazing, and it's just a, a unique way to reach kids and do stuff for wildlife and conservation. So, we're very excited about it. Well, and and you know, uh, you you are one of the many people that I have on the show, Chester. That is not really para related. Now, granted, you have a new book that's out. Yeah. You know, uh, just talked to you at Falk Monster Fest about it. You know, it's, it's Bigfoot <laughs> yeah. South, um, yeah. and. Uh, but but once again, that comes at things from very much a wildlife journalist, conservationist aspect. And, and much that. like we said last time we had you on the show, um, if you are a crypto fan out there, folks, mm. give, back people like Chester, back people like your your local coastal conservation, your mm. your local forestry services, things like that. Uh, we need to protect the habitat of these things i mean even even if we find out later that they exist it'll be too late at that point exactly and that's a big part of that like doing the cryptozoology stuff to me this is to me there's really not that much difference between the great white stuff and Mm -hmm. the crypto stuff it's just that we have one aspect of mysteries of something we know is proven and one we don't but one day maybe the other will be proven and all the research people are doing contribute it, to scientific understanding. It wasn't that long ago that you would have heard a marine biologist say you won't find a great white in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it would it would not have been more than a decade, 15 years ago that that would have been pretty well the consistent consensus. Yeah, but 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 my here, but maybe my crypto fandom uh, inspired this. But I I dug my whole life looking at journals and books and wondering about great whites in the Gulf. When I got that one report that people were like, that didn't happen because I trusted the guy. Yep, I knew him. Yeah, yeah. He had no gain from this. Yeah, I dug in and wrote an article, and I, you know, I'm not a big. I told you so. But guess what, folks? Told I told you, you so. so. You're here, baby. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You know, and uh, it, it, the the thing is, um, a especially the uptick is yeah. is interesting because it's not like they aren't here. Um, sure. and, and much like you said, these pings only happen when they come close to the sur- proximity of the surface. Yeah. You uh, know, but, but, but I will add a caveat to that. I found out that there are also one of the other kind of tags, an acoustic receiver. Mm, yeah. And the largest coral reef in the Northern hemisphere is, uh, the flower gardens, national Marine sanctuary, about 125 miles off of Galveston. And there is an acoustic receiver. You know, like when you go back with the, the, the toll tag thing on your yeah. car? Yeah. They essentially have a thing like that at the flower gardens under the water. Okay. And a lot of different fish, different species, tarpon, different things, are fitted with acoustic receivers. Sure. Well, a couple of the, two of the great whites that haven't breached yet have swam by the flower gardens. There are two other ones out there that have acoustic receivers on them. So Ooh. there's a lot of things going on pointing to this amazing return of an iconic creature. You know, next year we're entering the 50th year since Jaws came out. Yep. And um, and I am going to be work. I'm work. I'm beginning the work on a special media project that's going to coincide with that. And um, a lot of great stuff going on, man. And it's always great to be here and talk mysterious stuff. It may be mysterious stuff that's like proving like we know there are great whites, but we don't know a lot about them really. If you and, think and, about and we don't know exactly why they're here in the Gulf. Once again, to maybe hang around Florida. 
yeah. where there where there's manatees, you know, because because yeah. uh, I mean, of course, that's always the first thing to pop up in cryptozoology. As as King Gerhard even says in his class, the important part of cryptozoology is that zoo part, that zoo, zoo yep, that exactly. zoology part, because yep. without the zoology part, there it's not actually cryptozoology. Um, yeah. You're studying the zoology in the local area, the, the local food population. Could it support something of this size? Could yeah, but- could even the Gulf of Mexico, as as far as what we know, great white wise, because it's yeah. it's not like, uh, you know, I mean, our, I don't know, are great whites out like going after shoals of tuna? Well, this you is know? an interesting part of this. So we know that the we know that the population on the east coast northeast cape cod all that up there yeah. nova scotia you know we had an increase obviously after they were protected but a seal population had come back oh absolutely and, yeah and they're and they're eating the seals yeah that's one of their natural forms of food they love to eat uh the favorite thing they ever eats when a whale dies they eat whale yeah. carcasses it's like going to my for me i love chinese food going to a it's chinese a, buffet. buffet i feel like a great white well, bloated after eating on a whale carcass well and that's but just that, it. There's different parts of the life cycle and we know those young great whites by the way a mom can have two been documented two to 17 live born babes um two to 17 that are like five feet long <laughs> 17? Yeah, they shoot out. The That's most, massive. That was a rarity from what I've read, and I don't know all the research. It's a lot lower, three to four usually, something like sure, that. Sure, sure. A couple. But they've had up to 17. Can you imagine being a mom, great white, with 17 five-footers in your phone around? And they're live and, born. And they're live born because basically the eggs hatch inside yeah. instead of being out attached, you know. And can you imagine that little shark, which a five foot shark's a pretty good size. That's a full size black tip. Yeah. You know, that's a mid sized bull. Yeah. You know, and they and they, they know that they eat other little sharks. They eat um, a red tuna. They did a study and found out that redfish were on their diets in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. But what okay. are the what are the big what are the bigger ones? You know, uh, sea turtles or something to eat. What are the bigger ones eating? And um, the other thing is they really don't even know because I just had Megan Winton on with you know, White Shark Conservancy. Mm. They don't even know what their dietary requirements are, how much they have to eat. Yeah, it's another question. So a lot of great mysteries, and um, so it's it's fascinating stuff and teaches a lot about our ecology of the Gulf. But you know, we got a lot of other great sharks, you know, that are mysterious. And one of my favorite sharks in the world is the Greenland shark. And the Greenland shark have been documented, get ready for this, longer than the world's longest great white. What? They don't weigh as much, but they're longer. And they live beneath the ice in like Greenland and like other Nordic type places, you know, like really cold places that had Vikings. Like they have more, they have, they have Greenland and they're really weird, like long sharks that are brown looking and they yep. eat the seals and stuff and they found out that these things live to be like 600 years old right but guess what when they did a biological survey of the gulf of mexico after deep water horizon yep. they found two greenland sharks in the gulf of mexico wow wow and, and once again those are you know very very deep water Sharks, yeah. you know, which yeah, is and they, and why they, so you they rarely see them. The, and the theory is they came down the Gulf Stream and they just hung out in the deeper water and they, they and like, hey, I need a vacation too, man. You know, and uh, so you never know what's going to be out there. You never know. Like the orcas in the Gulf. I mean, that's a, that's a real thing. And wow. So there's a lot of things out there. I'm always trying to raise awareness, the profile of the Gulf itself and our conservation needs and take care of the waterways and no better way to do it than you know great whites and coming up with the jaws 50th year next year you know yeah. i saw it m- multiple years later i was too young to watch it when it debuted but my dad said when it came out he went from uh wade fishing up to here at, at sea rim state park on the upper coast to throw his rods out for yeah. more redfish to his knees he said yeah. it was knee level after yeah. jaws you no, know? no, and and that's just it. Like after my experience, like that's I'll go out, I'll go, I'll go swim, whatever, you know. But um, yeah, yeah, I ain't I ain't walking around with bait tied to my tied to my waist anymore. Like, well, you know, that ain't gonna happen. Having, 
seeing great whites now in the Pacific. Um, did a cage dive with them, and uh, it was a total dream come true. Um, you just have a lot of respect for that animal. I mean, massive, massive, massive animals. I saw four that day, um, and the biggest was around 18 feet, they said. Wow. It was an absolute. It was. They said it would be probably 3,000, maybe 3,500 pounds. I mean, a monster. Um, and you know, we went and it was, it was a pay deal. Like you go on a tour in the Farallon islands, about 25 miles off the coast of San Francisco. First off, if it was 25 miles to a great white Haven for me, it's being passed. I'd have been out there in my aluminum boat back in college trying to chum up great whites. You know what I mean? Like that would have happened. It's California. They're probably too, you know, formal for that up there. But I'm like, oh, the rednecks here, I would have had. Yeah, a chum slick as big as the Exxon Valdez. You know what I mean? <laughs> it would have been, it would have been a great white photographed I, behind my boat. And and honestly, that is the first thing that crossed my mind whenever I saw the articles and everything and started sharing them with you and stuff like that. Was like, yeah. I just I see all these bubbas. Like I see yeah. I see like the entire like you know Cajun. Uh, the what is it the the Cajun Armada that comes yeah. out and helps in hurricanes? Like I see those dudes out there just chumming water. Like oh hey, yeah, we gonna have a good sauce. If, like if I get a you know, <laughs> I remember at an oil rig one time we were going shark tagging and uh, a guy I know was fishing this near shore about two miles off the beach and and he had let me let me know he'd already been back. And brought a limited speckled trout and was catching another, which is illegal and it's BS to do that. I said, You need to leave, dude. Come on, we need to catch some sharks here. He's on the spot where we could fish. Yeah. And he goes, No, we're gonna we're gonna finish this set. I said, No, you're not. I started chumming. I literally I pulled I poured about a gallon at one time of chum in the water. He goes, You're gonna kill our trout fish. And I said, Oh yeah, you already got your limit, pal. Yeah. And about two <laughs> minutes later, a black tail went like like an F sixteen flying right by his boat. He goes, all right, we're done. We're out of here. So we, we went and tagged sharks and had a good time. But, wow. um, you know, when I saw those whites, we went on a tour. It was me and a couple from Las Vegas. That was their honeymoon. It was great white cage diving. Cool. And two, two brothers from the Bronx and me from Texas. And these Italian brothers from the Bronx are the thickest Bronx accent you can imagine. And there's a couple from Vegas and a Texan. It's like a joke. A Texan walks in a bar yeah. with two brothers from the Bronx and a couple from Vegas, you know. <laughs> and we're out there, and the, we almost didn't go out because the water was so rough. And I don't like rough seas, and it was rough. But yeah. I talked. I, I was like, look, man, I didn't come to San Francisco to see the nightlife. I want to see a great white shark. And we we went. We got on the, 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 the protected side of the island from the wakes and – they put the cage in the water and it was cold. So we had to make sure we could hang. So we all went in, but only two could go at a time. Yeah. And I'm not a genius, but I can do math. And there's only room for two and there's two brothers and there's a couple and there's this single Texas guy. Right. Yeah. So we go out and it's cold. I can hang. We do whatever. And I remember saying, hey, K-Man, look, I've, I've caught a lot of sharks, done a lot of shark tagging and stuff. I, can, I don't mind getting bloody and nasty. I'll chum. Sir, we can't chum. I said, why? <laughs> because we'll attract sharks to people. I said, that's why we paid to be here. That's, I'm pretty sure that's what we paid for, dude. And I'm like, oh, my God. He goes, well, we have bait. I said, oh, I thought, you know, semantics. Because sure. I have a book back here called Dangerous Sea Creatures, my favorite book ever growing up. And they had like a horse carcass hanging over on one of these boats. Seriously, like yeah. back in the day, Jacques Cousteau would have like a whole tuna overboard, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, I thought they're going to have a tuna or something in there. And I open this box. It's a surfboard, a yellow and red surfboard. And I hold it up. He goes, that's the bait. <laughs> and I'm like, like, hold on, I'll say. It's like a huge fishing spoon. Like this. I wish we were going to record this. I said, I'm not, I know I'm from Texas and y'all think we're slow. It's illegal to put fish oil in the water, which they're naturally attracted to, because you don't want to attract them to people. But you can train them to hit a surfboard? Yeah, yeah. And there's 10,000 guys a day in the water in California on surfboards? Yeah. He goes, yeah. I go, did you go to Berkeley? And he goes, how'd you know? I said, just a guess. Just, 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 <laughs> just a guess. Just a guess. So <laughs> I'm thinking we're getting scammed. You know what I mean? Wow. So we pull the surfboard for three hours and nothing happens. 
And um, I remember asking the guy that was kind of a real like um, chipper guy, you know, always kind of smiling. And I said, what happens if one of these wakes, you know, if the waves got bad and we took one and we had to swim to shore, he just goes, no. no. So yeah, you that knew there happen. were sharks around. <laughs> yeah. So it got, a few hours later, it got calm. He goes, is any good fishing guide who hasn't caught fish one morning says, we're going to the good side of the island now. We'll go around the good side of the island, quote unquote. Yeah. I'll never forget the moment, Chris. I'm chewing a Lay's potato chip, eating lunch. Everybody else is kind of tuning out. I'm watching this surfboard, like laser beam focused, and a 14-foot great white comes up, hits it, does a 360. Before wow. that shark hits the water, a second great white comes up and side swipes the board. Wow. I'm going, this is the coolest moment of my life. That's and awesome. And the people behind me, the guy goes, we're going to need a bigger boat. He actually did the Jaws quote. <laughs> and and so they put the cage in. Now the math kicks in. I'm going, I'll never get in there. And I kid you not, the guy, the couple, the guy and the couple goes, hey, Chester, man, like, my wife's feeling kind of seasick. And she don't want to go in because she's seasick. And I don't want to go in without her. So you can go in our place. I'm like, Yes. And then the Epic. Bronx guy comes up the bro's like, yo, our wetsuits aren't quite adequate for the current situation. <laughs> you can go in our place. <laughs> so they cool. lower the cage. Now, I'm not saying I'm Billy Badass here. I was like inspecting the welds on the cage and stuff. Oh, you know, like, darn tootin', man. Brother, I get in there and I, and I have to, there's a gap. I have to kind of make it across this gap into the cage and it's snuba. So you had an air. I could stay in a mm. long time. Yeah. And I jump in and I'm terrified because, and this wasn't like the Caribbean. It had been rough. I could see maybe 15 feet, maybe a little further. Wow. So Jaws is going to be right here, you know? And I had, this is right before I could, anybody could afford digital underwater cameras. I had 36 exposures yeah, on yeah. an underwater camera. Yeah. Your little disposable yeah. Kodak. And, but it was a good underwater camera, but it only had 36, you know, yeah. shots you know before i get digital so i'm just sitting there going it's gonna show up and it's the best angle and i'm like you know whatever and i'm going oh my god great white dream come true this is terrifying so they're pulling the surfboard now by hand to attract white shark. yeah yeah just spoon fishing with it yeah pretty much yeah and it gets caught up on the cage and i'm going <laughs> oh my god this is when the shit shark's gonna hit and i'm gonna be in the bottom of the pacific so i climb up and i'm helping him like get it off the cage and we're down there for a while and I'm getting cold, brother, because the water's like 53, yeah. 55 degrees. And that's cold. And I've been yeah. there, I've probably been there at this point about 45 minutes by myself in the Pacific Ocean. It was like being in a weird dream. It was like surreal, you know? Wow. And um, I'm sitting there and these little squid came up and a couple of fish, a little school of fish just kind of hanging around the cage. And I, I took a couple. <laughs> And all of a sudden, they left. They all left. They shot out of there. And I don't know how they did it, but it sounded like, in my mind, somebody put the Jaws music down there. I'm like, my mind, I'm hearing, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> And down below the cage, this gigantic dark shape is moving beneath the cage. And it circles, and it'll come, undulate, come in and out, and go that way. And I can just see a dark form, and it's huge, wow. kicking up silt. And it circles the cage, disappears, silt kind of gets in the bottom of the cage. And at this point, it got to the part in the song where like, -na -na. and in the movie, when that hit, somebody's dead, man. Yeah. And I'm like going, oh my God, what's going on? And then it just kind of disappeared. At this point, my teeth are chattering. I'm thinking I might be getting hypothermia for real. Yeah, right. So I, I got a, a signal to come up. I got out. They give me some hot chocolate and a little blanket around me, and I'm, and I'm getting warmed up. And they pulled the cage up by this point and they cranked the motor within five seconds of cranking the motor an 18 foot great white came up that's what had been circling the cage wow and when it hit it breached and it had the surfboard and when it breached its eye turned and looked at us they act, other people oh my god you see the eye the eye went i see y'all you know? <laughs> and it hit the water and there's a picture of me out there with the the surfboard and the bite mark is bigger than I, wider than I am. Wow. And I'm, and they pull that thing up. I'm looking for teeth. 
Yeah. I'm gonna like, fight somebody over a tooth on yeah, that yeah. dang circle. No tooth, but there was slobber and there was blood from the jaws yeah, right yeah. the surfboard. And um, it was incredible to see that, man. It was in an apex level dream. And this all started incredible. from this little boy who saw Jaws and then saw Jacques Cousteau Ocean Specials and bought a book called, his parents bought him a book called Dangerous Sea Creatures back right. here. And, and then I remember sitting on the 60, my first time seeing a shark was on the 61st Street Pier in Galveston. when I was 12 years old. Mm. And um, we were fishing and a couple of guys had, we just had, we were on vacation and we were catching like croaker and you know hardheads and stuff. And a couple of guys caught little bonnet heads and little Atlantic shark nose. And I was just intrigued because I'm looking at sharks for real for the first time. I remember yeah. looking out over the surf, moonlit night. And I said, dad, do you think there are any great whites out there? And he said, maybe so, son. You know, yeah. maybe so. Yeah. Now, there are great whites out there. That's right. And it connects me to that moment and mentorship and what we're trying to do. So that's really what GulfGreatWhites.com and Gulf Great White Sharks blog is all about. And um, it, It's been incredible to watch you grow it. It's been incredible to watch you build it. It's been great to watch you really follow the storyline as it develops and as yeah, man. As, as these counts continue to go up um and once again it's it's interesting like you said most of these tags that are being found are not acoustic tags they're they're standard surface tags so um there's more out there yeah there, there's, there's more those out are there only the I, tagged ones those are only yeah, the tagged so ones it, i think it's it's going to be really interesting cuz they're starting to catch a few of them you know, in, in Pensacola, there's been one caught. There's one at Panama City that's been caught and tagged and released. Um, a lot of those shark fish and surf guys are tagging for different regular programs. They're probably not putting a yeah. satellite tag, but it's like a fin tag on them or whatever. So we're going to start seeing more of that. And um, one thing I like about the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy is they also add safety into the equation. Mm. You know, the legitimate safety, you know, because yeah. the people need to know because – when Jaws come out, no one was trying to interact with sharks unless you maybe went on a cage dive somewhere, and that was a, like a, a not accessible. Yeah, you know? that would that wasn't a public kind of no. thing where it's like tourists go do that. Um, well, there was a dive shop in Florida. I got it on GulfGreatWhites.com, and I linked out to a video. They found out about a whale carcass off of uh, Venice Beach. And it had been hauled out and they went and there were some juvenile great whites on it and they went and free dive with them out there. Wow. Um, you know, so people interact with things differently now. Yeah. So my, you know, I want people to realize that's right. These are not, you know, these sharks are not your friends. They're not your enemy either, but they are an apex predator. Yeah. And so treat them as such and give them their space, enjoy them photograph them do what you got to do but um don't don't go, think don't get, think you have to one up the people you saw on youtube you well know? and 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 don't go doing like the like the people that just recently grabbed the baby bears out of the tree at the national park to go take pictures with it and yeah. and that's just it you know like you like every every year you hear about two or three people that got rushed by a bison because they they decided to go hang out next to this wild animal and take their picture it's like it's a wild animal yeah man it's still a, a, wild a cage animal. dive is awesome i would do it i salute people I, do other kinds of research but you know make sure you know what you're doing and how and, yes. and be careful out there yeah. and if and just in general shark safety if you are wade fishing and i wade fish um make sure you have one of the basket style uh you can put the fish in it helps a lot a long lead behind you yeah yeah um, nothing short and take all of the safety precautions and um if you see a big shark in the surf and you know it might be time to exit the surf for a little yeah. while you know yeah um and just be cautious out there and don't fear them but also respect them and um if you have any reports of great whites in the gulf of mexico historical photos maybe of your family with mm. one they caught or teeth that you collected or a big mako or any big shark stories from the gulf you know just contact me through gulf great white sharks gulf great whites.com i'd love to share that stuff and share the love of sharks and of mysteries in the gulf of mexico Heck yeah, man. And, uh, you know, we have a few more minutes uh, yeah. in that time because the, the the great thing is that 
once again, cryptozoology includes that zoo part, includes yeah, the, the real part. part. And, uh, you know, Texas is huge with its tall tales, to, oh, yeah. to say the <laughs> least. One of one of them is, of course, the, the idea that Pecos Bill wrote a catfish, famously. Uh, and there have been a lot of reports lately about some really really big catches going on like there's the there's the 62 blue catfish the 62 pound blue that was just caught not too long ago um on falcon lake and uh, there have been stories for years about massive catfish near dams things like that catfish big I, enough i to, did an investigation of that back in like oh four oh five and ken gearhart helped me on one of those mm. actually so wow. a guy had caught the world record blue catfish at lake texoma mm -hmm. and it was in the winter and catfish are tough he wrapped it in a tarp put a bunch of water on it and drove it to athens texas to the texas freshwater fishery center and it was alive Oh, it I wouldn't doubt that one 100, bit. 130 pound blue cat. Whoa. World record. Kept it alive. And I always heard about these divers below the dams. It was yep. these Volkswagen sized yeah. fish and they wouldn't dive again. So I thought this was a unique opportunity for me to get in the water with the world's largest known blue catfish. Because if it was a catfish full of the dam, it was only one or two in America, it was going to be a blue or a flathead. The only one yep. that could even remotely get any kind of giant size. Yeah. And I wanted someone to photograph me to show scale with the fish. And I wanted to get the idea under the water with magnification to look what it would be like. And mm, when yeah. I went down there, Texas Parks and Wildlife was gracious enough to let me go do this at their Texas Freshwater Fishery Center. They gave me a bag of shiners to feed the bass. Cool. And a couple of rainbow trout and koi to feed the catfish. And I got that big catfish to eat out of my hand twice, which was. Wow, uh, dude. Wow. My friend, my friend, Gerald I've, Burley photographed. There's a picture of me. I've been noodling once and I can't imagine what that would be like. <laughs> it, was, it was wild. <laughs> well, I got the idea. This cat looked bigger than that to me underwater, um, mm. you know, and my theory is that number one, no one has ever come forward and been that diver. No one's ever been the diver that saw this. It's always their brother's ex girlfriend's former roommate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I always go back to that, that space balls reference, you know, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I'll throw that little nugget out there, Yeah. but no one's ever been that person. So I think probably what happened is in these murky waters in East Texas, someone had an encounter with one of these, 120, 130, they're maybe even there. 150 they're, pound they're blue there. catfish or flathead. And it got in their face and it scared the crap out of them. And that began the, the journey of these giant catfish stories. But that same year I went to Spain, me and my wife, Lisa went to Spain and fished in the Segra river where Jeremy Wade of river monsters told me to go. Mm. And we went with a guide down in Spain and caught Wells catfish. Okay. Yeah. We both caught seven foot long wells. Wow. Mine, mine weighed 157. My wife's weighed 163. And wow. there was a, there was a different giant catfish story there. My guy named aid, we were up on this big bank and he would have to go into the water and, and he would get the fish in. Right. Well, he had a big scar, almost all, a round scar all the way across his back. I said, what happened? He goes, I was in the water with one of these really big wells and I tripped. And when I did, I, I hit the water and the wells attacked me and bit my back. Wow. He said the divers in Spain, when they work on the, on the, um, the dams have to do it in shark cages because the wells will come up and mess with them because the catfish will come up and yeah. yeah. I, and I, we know those catfish get to 10 feet. I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt it. Catfish are and pretty it aggressive. Was, it, it wasn't a matter of them eating people. It was a matter of them taking your mask off, taking your tank yeah. off, taking your 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 BC off, and messing with you. So, wow. Oh yeah. So I've I've done some crazy stuff, and I remember me and Ken went to um, um, B A Steinhagen Reservoir called Dam B. It's the flood control dam below Sam Rayburn Reservoir. And there have yep. been stories down there because of after 9 11 we couldn't get access to too close to the dam but we found the deepest spot in the channel before the dam and kim was up top kind of videotaping and stuff and i went down on a tether 
because it was like one foot visibility, yeah. maybe up two feet, on a tether down about 30 feet. And I just sat there for about 20 minutes or so and, uh, and got acclimated. I saw one little white bass swim by me. Um, and and, and that, that's when it clicked that if any catfish of any size, 100 pound plus swim by you in that condition, it'd scare the crap out of you. So yeah, I think, I think there are truths to the legend, but they're not the size of a Volkswagen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, and I mean, even to that fact here in the last year, the guy who caught the 283 pound, hundred inch long gar, you yeah. know, um, that's, that's massive. It's that's a massive fish, man. Massive. It's a massive, massive, and, and, massive. And, like, and like that is one that when, when the head itself is almost the size of an adult alligator, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's, that, it's, that would be a frightening fish to have on the other end of a steel leader. That's all I'm saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've caught a lot of garfish. Dealt a lot with garfish. They are a pretty amazing creature in their own cool. right. And there's some giant stories about them. I got a blog at HigherKong.net coming up about a giant garfish report that'll be up here in a well, couple of weeks. And and they're out there. They're out there. Like I I have seen eight foot gar like in the yeah. in. I grew up on Buffalo Bayou in Houston, uh, going yep. out snake hunting, lizard hunting, things like that. I'd, I'd yep. see yep. six foot gar, seven foot gar swimming in the shallows all the time. You yeah, know? there are there are some neat stuff out there. So there's always a mystery, whether it's in the bayou down the road from your house or the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic yeah. or the Pacific. There's always something or in the woodlot. And that's what keeps us going here, man, is this that's opportunity. It to do this cool stuff and investigate the mysteries, you know? Well, and, uh, you know, uh, not just that, but dispel the myths, Chester, yep. especially when it yep. comes to wildlife conservation, especially when it comes to what is out there in that Bay of Yuhu, you know? Yep. And, and when it comes down to it, the idea of safety, safety with all of it. That's, that's what I yep. love talking about you with is the idea yep. of a passing these things down to the next generation, preserving mm -hmm. them for the next generation, but also making sure that people who are going out squatching are safe and think of yep. their safety first, much like you talk about in dark outdoors. Dark outdoors. Yeah. That's part, part of that. You know, we did a shark actually episode of dark outdoor. You want to talk yep. about shark safety. We have a shark episode of Dark Outdoors. It was up the first season. You can find that any major podcast and platform. But yeah, safety. I mean, we have this ministry research uh, project that we do with kids and help them. Do, they do part of our journalism and our mission is bring the love of Christ to hurting kids through wildlife encounters. But when you take a kid into the woods and their families, especially they've been through trauma, mm -hmm. you want to make sure they're safe or out in yeah. the water. So yeah. always investigate the area you're going first. Learn about the area. I have areas I do not go anymore because of my dark outdoors factor. That you, yeah, there are dangers, human dangers that I don't go. There are places that I will not go. Same thing, like you mentioned, the Bay of Yuhu, Galveston. Um, I filmed an episode of When Sharks Attack about six years ago. There, I was their Texas, one of their Texas shark experts, right? Awesome. And when, when I pulled up, it looked like it was that weird phenomenon when the currents change, and it looked like the Caribbean. Oh, yeah, it where was, it's just crystal blue. And I pulled up, and this team were all, like, from D.C. They're like, I didn't know Galveston had this kind of surface, and it doesn't. Film it, does, it now because yeah. it'll look different in an hour, you know. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the sharks aren't the most dangerous thing on Galveston Island. The currents are the rip currents are bad yeah. there. Yeah. So be careful in learning about the places you go in nature because, you know, just a little bit of precaution can save your life out there. You That's know? right. That's right. And, uh, you know, even if you if, if, if you are going out doing things like that, um, make sure you let somebody know your general direction. Make sure you let yeah. them know an approximate time that you should be checking in or that you yeah. should be calling to say you're home. Never, and if anything, never go to the bayou by yourself. You know what that's I mean? A great, that's a great slogan right there. I need to trademark that one, Chris. That's, that's know, one that we used to use on retreat all the time whenever we were on the bayou. It was like, hey, yeah. feel free to go meditate on the bayou, but do not go to the bayou by yourself. No, all right. It's, it's true. And I, I end up going a lot of places by myself because when you're a, an adult age working man in the middle of the week, when most of my time, if I have any, it's in the week. It's never on the you, weekends. I'm booked. Um, you live in the I, field, man. You I live have to go by field. myself sometimes, but I limit where I go and I have two different, my wife always knows. Yeah. And I have two different people 
guys that I know, my cousin and my friend Jerry, I'll call them, hey, I'm going to be here. And then I have a thing called, a, it's, it's a Spot X transponder. And I carry that with me. And yeah. uh, if the emergency happens, I can just hit one button and every uh, rescue centered agency in the region will be given a, a, you know, a GPS coordinate. Yeah, you know? you'll be pinged and, immediately. You know, there's the other side of things. I was just interviewed for something else this morning, a couple of hours ago, and they were like, uh, "It was about it was about the the crypto stuff." And like, would you yeah. ever sleep in the Big Thicket National Preserve or some other crypto location without a weapon by yourself? I said, "I don't go to Walmart without a weapon." I said, yeah. "I'm in Texas." I said, "I'm not yeah. going out there without a weapon." <laughs> I said, "Have you seen some of the people out there?" You know, uh, so there, be, be, learn how to defend yourself. You know, yes. be, be be proficient with a firearm. Um, and I, I can't go over enough the research where you're going to be and learn the potential dangers, so That's you can right. eliminate those dangers and have a good time. That's right. That's right. Absolutely, Chester. Thank you so much as always for the time, dude. It's always great talking with you. Um, I I can't wait to dig into Bigfoot South. It's going to be fantastic. I have been looking forward to this book for a while. So, so glad that you finally got it kicked out of the port and that you've got more coming. More coming. Oh, yeah. So, um, let everybody know one last time where they can go to follow uh, the new Great White blog uh, over at Great gulfgreatwhites.com where they can go to find dark outdoors where they can go to help with higher calling wildlife all that kind of yeah so you can go to highercalling.net and there's links to all of that stuff on there but there's it says our conservation outreach on there that's where you can support our program um and you can support that with financial donations we are uh you can donate and get a tax deduction for that yeah and um Dark Outdoors and Higher Con of Wildlife, the podcast are all major podcasts and platforms, whether you listen to Apple Podcasts, whether you listen to Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, we're everywhere. There's also the the, the website, darkoutdoorspodcast.com. You can get some of that on there. There's also the documentary that we filmed with Paul Fazinski, mm-hmm. Journey into the Dark Outdoors, golfgreatwhites.com, and follow me at the Chester Moore on Instagram. Fantastic. Chester Thank you so much as always, my friend. Greatly appreciate it. Hold the line real quick while we close things out on the show. While you are online checking out all of the amazing work of Chester Moore and Higher Calling Wildlife, everybody, make sure to stop on by Curious Realm, CuriousRealm.com. Oh, and Bigfoot South as well. Uh, BigfootSouth.com. Make sure to stop on by Curious Realm. CuriousRealm.com is where you can like, follow, subscribe, share, comment. That's where you can find all of the episodes. That's where you can find the store. CuriousRealm.com forward slash store will take you to all of our guest books, videos, and more. Uh, You can also, if you're a Roku user, download the all new free Curious Realm Roku app brought to you by Always Press Record Productions. It's got all of our awesome episodes on it as well as hours of free, that's right, free binaural beat and frequency meditation music made by yours truly. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in as always. It is your open hearts, your open minds that make the world what it is. It's what makes the conversation. And without the conversation, humanity does not march forward. So thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And stay curious. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Curious Realm. Stay tuned for more guests, forbidden topics, and hidden truths. Follow us on social media by searching Curious Realm. To download the official Curious Realm app and view the Knowledge Vault or become a sponsor of Curious Realm, visit our website at CuriousRealm.com. Curious Realm is available on your favorite podcast and video services, as well as KPNL Radio, APR TV, and the Curious Realm app for Roku devices. Curious Realm is a proud member of the Ground Zero Media and Aftermath Media family of podcasts. For more great shows and members-only content, visit groundzeromedia.org and aftermathmedia.com today. Thanks for listening. Stay curious. And remember, the other side is always watching.